Salvation as a total surrender to God. 1. The purpose of ecumenical studies, as it is at present employed, is to examine and encourage bases of religion and the cooperation between people of various religions. Some Western dictionaries, I notice, define this activity as being concerned with the Christian Church only, and the use of the word as confined solely to the Roman Catholic Church is noted in such authorities as the Oxford English Dictionary. Ecumenical, of course, is of Greek derivation, meaning belonging to the whole world. I shall assume, consistently with my presence here, that the narrower definitions just referred to are not sustained by my audience. It is interesting to me, however, to note them, for they both indicate the assumption, in some minds at least, that a given way of thinking expressed in certain institutions is universal on the negative side, and that my audience, at least, is contemporary enough in its objectivity to hear, at least, the ideas of those who do not belong to the theological formulations which constitute the background of their own attitudes on the positive side. I need not say which one I prefer. Since I have been asked to contribute on Salvation as a Total Surrender to God, an attempt at dialogue between Christians and Muslims, and Geneva University has honoured me by naming me a visiting professor and suggesting this subject, I would like, after expressing my gratitude for the opportunity to teach at this ancient and illustrious institution, to indicate that I propose to introduce the subject 1. From an Islamic viewpoint 2. In its historical context, however rapidly 3. As something which has existed since the beginnings of Islam, nearly 15 centuries ago, again with examples and 4 as an opportunity of bridge-building for the present and future, as well as the utilisation of the bridges, which are of considerable antiquity and tested strength. Christian writers and scholars frequently complain that Muslims have distorted ideas about what the Christians believe and what they practice. This may well be so, Though as one who was brought up in an ancient and formal Muslim family with extensive experience of discussion with Muslims of many countries and every walk of life, I cannot recall anything analogous even to the report published not long ago by an American who attended a school run by the Arabian American Oil Company in New York. Butler, G.C., Kings and Camels, New York, 1960. He tells us, The questions, what is Islam, and who was the Prophet Muhammad, brought forth some interesting answers. One of our members thought that Islam was a game of chance similar to bridge. Another said that it was a mysterious sect founded in the South by the Ku Klux Klan. One gentleman believed it to be an organization of American Masons who dress in strange costumes. The Prophet Muhammad was thought to be the man who wrote the Arabian Nights. Another said that he was an American Negro minister who was in competition with Father Divine in New York City. One of the more reasonable answers came from one of our men who said, Muhammad had something to do with a mountain. He either went to the mountain or it came to him. In quoting this extract, Professor James Kritzek, the illustrious Orientalist, who is Director of the Institute for Advanced Religious Studies and Professor of Oriental Languages and History at Notre Dame University, comments, Even supposing these answers to be no more than facetious guesses, they still reveal an appalling ignorance on the part of American adults of better-than-average educational backgrounds, who were, moreover, on their way to employment in Saudi Arabia. Anthology of Islamic Literature, London, 1964. During the months in which I have been actively working on and thinking about the preparation of this material, I mentioned my task and the pleasure which I was taken in the prospect of contributing on this subject to a certain bishop. His words in comment were, 
Islam? That load of old rubbish. You don't mean to tell me that anyone in his right mind is taking an interest in it? Well, I suppose that we must take it as part and parcel of the present-day decay of standards and the resort of the foolish young to oriental religions and tomfoolery like astrology and witchcraft. Your friends would be better advised to seek solid Christian guidance on the truth of Christianity, which would soon put an end to that nonsense. To every minus, of course, there is a plus. There is no likelihood that the venerable bishop who will follow this exposition is capable of any attitude like that of the one whom I quote. And most felicitously, as I write these words, as if to redress the balance, I open an envelope from my local Protestant vicar, the erudite and much respected Reverend Johnson. It contains a greeting card for the festival of Eid al Fitr, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan, which falls today. Another senior cleric of another Christian persuasion took me to his bookshelf where he proved from his books that Muslims worshipped idols called termagants. This word in Middle English appears in the old romances and is synonymous with a boisterous troublemaker. Turgavants, from the Latin vasari, to turn, means, among other things, to apostatize. Perhaps at one time this was applied to Christians who became Muslims. It is also noted in Reinaud's Invasions, quoted below. He also said that he had read that the Muslims believed that Muhammad's coffin was suspended miraculously in the air, but were not allowed to see it, and that very far from such people being able to surrender to God, their first need was to surrender to truth and save their souls by conversion to Christianity. The rumour in Europe that Muhammad's coffin was suspended by magnetism in the air between mountains was scotched more than 450 years ago. And you must know, I tell it to you for a truth, there is no coffin of iron or steel nor lodestone nor any mountain within four miles. The Travels of Ludovico di Varthema, 1503-1508, London, the Hakluyt Society, 1863, quoted by Saunders John L. in The Muslim World on the Eve of Europe's Expansion, New Jersey, Prentice Hall, 1966. I don't think he was very pleased when I decided to answer him on his own level and said, It sounds a most attractive religion, but I am afraid that I will just have to try to surrender to God, since I don't think that the termagants will let me accept your deep erudition. The purpose of relating these instances to you is to underline the fact that when we are talking about Christians and Muslims, we must first make sure that we are talking about people who have an idea, which should be more or less correct, as to what the other is supposed to believe and what he is expected to do as a consequence of that belief. From personal experience and the examination of literature, I feel that we cannot take for granted that a dialogue without information and perhaps without understanding, is possible between any individuals or groups on all levels. So the prerequisite is information. There are, indeed, facilities for the instruction of members of various faiths in the beliefs and practices of others, and books are an obvious source. And there are many people, both Muslim and Christian, who have a good grasp of each other's conceptions of surrender to God and other principles. But the widespread existence of bias, misinformation and lack of knowledge, as well as the enshrining in the very languages which we speak of phrases and formulae which maintain and reinforce the age-old prejudices implanted by ignorant or fanatical ideologists, militate against the effectiveness of dialogue even if they do not exclude it, by the most subtle and one of the most effective of instruments, the subconscious, almost the subliminal introduction of hostility. From imperial, economic and ideological causes, many cultures are the inheritors, and hence the prisoners, of attitudes of scorn and disdain for other faiths, outlooks which are not ennobling to anyone, 
and which I submit are positive barriers to the carrying out of basic injunctions, whether these be to love one's neighbour as oneself or to respect the beliefs of others, let alone to seek knowledge about them. And so a major concern may be represented in this fashion. The ecumenical idea cannot even be approached without knowledge of one's own beliefs and those of others. The surrender to God cannot be understood or coexist with refusal to surrender to facts. God may be above facts, but he does not dispute them. How then can man presume to do so?